Yes, sir. Did you always endeavor to move into politics, or was that another one of the sort of the evolutions of? of the I was always interested time? in politics. I always thought that most politicians were not so great, and that having somebody who actually created jobs uh, was uh, of value. And uh, I won't take you through that, but I was a Senate candidate, and I got called to the White House and asked to step out. And I was a big mistake, and so on. I ended up being chairman of the Illinois Republican Party. I was assistant campaign manager for Bush 41. I had finance and surrogates and all that. It's a very interesting process. It helps you understand what's wrong with our country uh, and what's right with our country. <laughs> uh, I call it the tyranny of the uninformed majority. Okay? And here I am in California. I get myself in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, but I, was all, I think it's important stuff. And uh, I was a delegate of the United Nations. I was able to figure, in, in the year I spent there, I realized how useless that is, even though the concept is beautiful. Um, so it's part of what drives me is intellectual curiosity. You know, if you're reading about something, you're saying it, wouldn't it be good, whether it's the ballet or the politics or business or whatever, to get into it and really kind of learn what's there. Richard Feynman said, everything is interesting if you look deeply enough. And uh, so if this could take us off somewhere. Let's do another course. Of this. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, like, so when you were in LA or a part of McKinsey, you decided you wanted to go out and do something different. What approach did you take? How did you end up finding the company in Illinois? I mean, what, what uh, got you there? Um, <coughs> network. Um, you know, one of the things in life, what I'm trying to express in the book I'm writing is, you have a plan, you figure out where you're going to be 10 years from now, and you're moving along toward that plan, but then things happen, and you have to grab them and evaluate them and so forth. I was, uh, in the early days, before the investment banks made such a hash of it, I was uh, the partner in charge of the merger and acquisition practice at McKinsey Worldwide from LA, myself and another guy. So I was running around the world giving speeches on how you buy companies. And with my engineering training here at UCLA, I was the first one, there's two Harvard Business Review articles on this, which you can look up on their website, to apply discounted cash flow to, to evaluating a merger. And uh, that sounds so obvious now, but it wasn't then. Um, and so I was asked to give a speech for the Harvard Business Group Club of New York, a guy named John Whitehead, who was, uh, was the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And so I, was, I developed a network in New York, New York, Got it? How many from New York? How many got it, huh? um, And so I got a call from New York. I said, you know, you're talking about buying companies. How would you like to run one? And I said, I'm too busy. I've got a plant in Illinois. I've got, you know. And I was, it was earlier than I had planned to leave. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you're not too busy. To, you, you, how about if we go to the airport and I'll get a limo and so forth. And so they actually, actually got recruited. <coughs> to run this company. Now, I looked at the product line, it was a dog. I mean, it was the most low-tech stuff. And I fancied myself as an engineer that I'd do something much more and my mother would be more proud of. My mother <laughs> always said, what are you doing in valves? You know, I, I raised my son for valves. Well, I, I, I made him happier when we got into building controls and computers and stuff. But, um, so I, that's how that happened. But it happens all kinds of different ways. Now, I was also kind of quietly proactive, poking around. And I noticed that there was a Wall Street firm that was financing entrepreneurs. It was made especially of taking underperforming companies, uh, working with the owners to put new managers in and giving those new managers a stake. And that company was, in those days, the name was Baird. Uh, and they would actually warehouse a, 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 a CEO wannabe in their office and he would then uh, go out and look for companies, and they, and they would pay his salary. Because most of us, I mean, I was in debt coming out of business school. Most of us don't have the money to support your family and your mortgage and everything with no income. I, I certainly wasn't, I, you know, even though I, I was a partner at McKinsey. I mean, I had an ownership in McKinsey. You know, I was a junior partner. I was there for, uh, you know, it was kind of in my first year. So, uh, that part was the hardest part for me. I, I was 
worried about how I was going to feed my kids. <laughs> is that helpful? Yeah, I just kind of call So, how did you, what, what sold you on your company? I went there to visit. Some guy calls you and says, Yeah, you know, I said, Well, geez, this is a dog. It's lost money seven out of nine years. It's an Edison. It's low tech. Um, it's got three unions in it. Uh, you know? And he said, Well, you know, you come to, you come to Chicago anyway because I know you've got a client there. How about if you, can we buy you dinner next time you're in Chicago? They bought me dinner, and the most wonderful guy whom I dedicated my book to, who ended up being my <coughs> father, who was my mentor, was at the dinner. And he was the guy that had the controlling block. And, and he gave me this belt that I wear everywhere. Uh, he, he was an entrepreneur who had a 70,000 acre ranch in Arizona, who wanted somebody to run this company that he bought share. So I said, okay, I'll go look at the company. And I, there was 700 people in the company, and it wasn't making any money, and it looked like it was headed nowhere. And I thought, these people need somebody. So I did, you know. And so if I had done my the kind of market research that you all do here, I would have said, no way, on to the next. But I, there, was, there is a place for emotion, and I think a very important place for people that you know you can work with. If I had had a great company and crummy, difficult people that were in control, I was able to then gradually get control myself. Um, so that's, it's complicated, but I'll give you an idea. Yes, ma'am? So uh, once you got there, what were the first three things that you changed? There you go. I, I say, what do you have three things? <laughs> um, we needed younger, more energetic management. Uh, there were some very nice people that were running the pieces of the business. So I had a friend of mine who was a uh, brilliant uh, guy who was a banker scholar at Harvard Business School who was able to persuade to come in as VP Finance. Another guy from UCLA who was a uh, hobby of fine engineer, uh, business school guy. I got the two of them in. That was number one. Because now it wasn't just me. It was energy that was, uh, you know, folks. And, and I gave them stock so that they could be millionaires if, if we took this thing and made something out of it. Second thing is I went out and I talked to all of the customers uh, because I thought that we were going to need to acquire companies to, to have a critical mass. And to acquire companies, I needed to know what the customers were and what else they bought because that was my strategy, working from the customers back. Um, that turned out to be a very uh, good idea to visit the customers. And I visited one customer. It turned out they were getting ready to dump us. And that represented 40% of the uh, uh, profits. So that was another one of those near-death experiences. Um, but, but going out visiting customers and developing a strategy was, was number two. And then uh, it's hard to say what number three was, except that I spent an awful lot of time having what we call beer and pizza sessions, uh, where you take 25 to 50 people at a time after work and talk to them, get feedback from them on what they thought we could do to make the company work better. And that way you convert. <coughs> people talk about management as they. I don't know if you do that in your company, but companies I've been in. So I say, you know, I am they. <laughs> Now let's talk about what we need to do. So those those would be three very uh, early things. Yes, ma'am. So one thing you Leslie mentioned. Leslie Monroe. Yes. That sounds Scottish. Uh, the last name is Scottish. And McDougal is Scottish, and I know where the Monroes are from, but let's not. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned that as a CEO, sometimes it's necessary to do a deep dive in a special project to really understand or get results. Um, and I would something agree. that's broken. Yeah. yeah, but my question is, how do you avoid an issue where then the rest of the staff feels a lack of ownership? <coughs> it feels like, don't worry, I'm, I won't stress, because someone else will go in, do the deep dive, and take care of the difficult problem. Well, the deep dive isn't something you do every day. It's something you do when you have a problem that is of a level everybody realizes that something really needs to be done. And they, I think, welcome 
mm -hmm. the extra attention. Because, for example, if a sales manager went to the top uh, VP purchasing at Exxon, it's a different experience than having the CEO. I mean, it's a different mm -hmm. meeting in a different way. So, but they are there at your side. Mm -hmm. Now, at that particular meeting, they didn't come to that meeting because at that time, Henry Kissinger was in vogue and he was kind of a Lone Ranger cowboy going off there. I thought that I would look more sympathetic all by myself. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, but they, we agreed, we talked about that and we agreed to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you have the right kind of compensation structure, if you have the right kind of reporting structure, if, if the atmosphere of the company is right, you will have ownership. And one of the things about a smaller company is uh, you can't make the mistakes that the big guys make and survive. So I think there is a feeling, a more intimate feeling of a connection between the work that you do and the survival of the company. Mm 